Hi, you're watching FaceTime. I'm in conversation with Mr. Kishore Mehbubani, Dean and Professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. Professor Mehbubani, welcome to the show. My pleasure. Right. I'm going to ask you about your book, The Great Convergence, Asia, the West and the Logic of One World. In what context are you using the word convergence in your book? Well, very simply, uh, for the past 200 years, uh, the West has been dominating world history and indeed uh, enjoyed living standards that were much higher than the rest of the world. Now what's happening, uh, especially in the last 20 to 30 years, is that the rest of the world is now converging uh, on Western living standards. And to just give you one statistic, today in all of Asia, from West Asia to East Asia, the size of the Asian middle class is about 500 million people. But by 2020, the number is gonna explode from 500 million to 1.75 billion, an increase of three and a half years, uh, three and a half times in 10 years or so, which is a remarkable transformation and which illustrates the great convergence that is happening. Is this a convergence of living standards, so to speak, or of societal aspiration? Oh, I think it's, it's a, it's a multi-dimensional thing because the reason why you're having this convergence in living standards is because people now have much higher aspirations, you know? And uh, the survey after survey will, will show to you that if you talk to uh, people in China and in India and in Southeast Asia, most of them believe that their children will have a better life than they did. And by contrast, uh, if you go to Europe today and you did a similar survey, they'll say, I'm not so sure that, that my children, children will have, have a better, better life, life than me. Okay. And that's a remarkable transformation uh, in the nature of human history because until now it's been the West that's always been the most optimistic uh, area of humanity and now it's shifting to the East. So many of the people who reviewed and criticized your book call yeah. you an irrepressible, irrepressible optimist yes. that in the long run you believe that we are all better off as a, yeah. as a society and things are getting better all the yes. time. May I contrast that with a slight misquoting of Keynes saying in the long run we are all dead. <laughs> Isn't it the short and medium run that matters not the ultimate long run? Uh, are well, people getting worse off in the medium run? Well actually you know uh, uh, you're right I'm an irrepressible uh, optimist, optimist. And, and, and fortunately <laughs> The data is on my side in terms of decline of wars and conflict, uh, elimination of absolute poverty, explosion of middle classes. And frankly, if the Asian middle classes go from 500 million in 2010 to 1.75 billion by 2020, you and I and a large part of humanity will still be alive six years from now to experience this incredible shift. Uh, that is happening and it's not, I'm not just speaking about the long term, uh, I'm speaking very much about the short term and the medium term and indeed the next five to ten years could be among the best five to ten years that humanity has enjoyed and that even though it's such a remarkable fact, people haven't absorbed or accepted yet. How important are three things to your hypothesis? One, democracy, two, liberalism, three, free capital. Well, I would say uh, of the three, free capital is the most important. Okay. Because, you know, it has been uh, an assumption in the West that no society can progress uh, until it enjoys democracy. Unfortunately, there's a very large exception to that rule, which is China, which in the last 30 years has experienced the greatest, fastest economic growth the greatest increase in uh, human living standards, and also, by the way, the greatest expansion in terms of personal freedoms. And that's why, you know, that's you know in, in, in Mao's time, Mao never allowed any Chinese to become a tourist to travel overseas. But today, you know how many Chinese leave China freely? And how many China return to China freely? It's 100 million Chinese, twice the population of France. Now, if 100 million Chinese decide to leave China freely and return to China freely, something has changed fundamentally in Chinese society where the people obviously believe that they have enough personal liberty to grow and develop themselves even though they don't have a democracy. And that's why I think that it's a mistake to think that you need to have democracy first before you have development, even though I believe in the long run, all of us have to become democracies.
Okay, in the extreme long run, democracy is important. But you are saying in the in the meantime, yes. uh, the rise of capitalism can be yeah. a strong force in creating human. Uh, certainly, the rise of capitalism has transformed uh, societies around the world. Although I prefer the term free market economics. Okay, let's say free market capitalism. economics. Yeah. Many of the critics of free market economics in India, especially since liberalization in 1990, have argued while that the rich have gotten richer, the middle class has become a little richer, mm. the extremely poor have actually become poorer in the last 20 years. Mm. That people living at the extreme margin, that the free market doesn't look after the people at the extreme margins. Yeah. And therefore, it's not such a good thing after all. Well, actually, uh, let me just give you a simple example from China to illustrate how economic growth helps people at the very bottom. Uh, I tell a very simple story. I know a well-known novelist who lives in Shanghai. And she says when she goes to the hairdresser, the lady who cuts her hair is an expert, a skilled worker. But the lady who washes her hair is an unskilled worker, okay. right, from the poor. You know, she said when she first arrived in Shanghai, the unskilled workers would come from five miles away. That's where the poverty was. Then it became 10 miles away. Then it became 50 miles away. And today, the unskilled workers from the poor come from 200 miles away. So it shows you how the free market economics has eradicated poverty further and further away from Shanghai. Okay. And this is not through government intervention. This is through economic growth. And I'm sure the same is true in India, uh, as, well. In India as well. One of the contentions in your book is that war is a sunset industry, mm. that we're going to see the end of organized war as this multi-billion mm. dollar industry. Speaking as an average citizen, every day I open the newspaper, some war is erupting somewhere in the world yeah. and there's a looming threat of another yeah. big war between the West and the East or the North and the yeah. South. How are you so confident that war yeah. is a sunset industry? Well, uh, you know, newspapers are designed to sell bad news. Okay. So, no, no they newspaper... They don't report on the good news. <laughs> <laughs> so, no newspaper <coughs> sells on good news. So, if there's a war in Syria... Uh, if there's a war in Sudan, uh, if there's a war in Iraq, you read about it in the newspapers. But you know, today, if you add up the total populations of all the countries that are experiencing war, Some like Iraq, war. Syria, Sudan, you know, you know what? It's a drop in the ocean of the 7 billion people on our planet. So if you look in terms of data and in terms of statistics, the number of people experiencing war and it's conflict has shrunk dramatically in the last 20 to 30 years. And there's a book by a Harvard professor, uh, Steven Pinker, called The Better Angels of Our Nature, which documents this profoundly. Okay. I'm going to quote another metaphor that you use in your book. You're saying that once upon a time we lived in a hundred different boats. Mm. Now we seem to live in one large boat with 193 cabins and 193 captains. Mm. Right. So I, I'm assuming this is a metaphor for the fact that we're a connected world and we're all in the same boat right mm. now. But 193 cabins and 193 captains sounds like the recipe for disaster globally. Mm. Mm. How are you confident that this boat will steer itself to the right destination? Well, that's precisely why you have to read my book. Okay. <laughs> because the reason why I wrote this book at this point in time, I say, having engineered the greatest convergence ever seen in human history, we seem to be walking away from the consequences of that convergence, which means that now we no longer live in 193 separate boats. We live in 193 separate cabins on the same boat. But you can't have a situation where you're just taking care of your cabin and nobody's taking care of the global boat as a whole. And that's why you had this global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, and the leaders had to come out of their cabins, go to London, attend the G20 leaders meeting, and launch a global stimulated financial push to solve the global economy. Professor, so that's I, what we need to have more of. And I am confident that even though we will not have a global government, we can strengthen institutions of global governance like the World Bank, IMF, United Nations, World Trade Organization, and that can happen. But many would argue that you know, institutions like the United Nations and World Bank are not truly representative of a global government. It's representative of a Western-dominated model of global governance, which we in the East and South will simply reject. You're absolutely right. That's true. As long as the World Bank and IMF continue to have the rule that to become the head of the World Bank, you must be an American. To become the head of the IMF, you must be a European. Then, of course, they don't, they don't represent. And it's very designed. It's but flawed. you notice at the G20 leaders meeting in London, uh, at least it, as a first step, the West has now acknowledged that this rule has to end. 
And it's, it's, there will be resistance from the West to share the power it has accumulated, but that resistance will be worn down. And that's not cause enough for what? The resistance of the West? Uh, oh, absolutely not. Because okay. I think, you know, the, the, the West realizes more than any other part of the world that if, if wars happen, they have the most to lose. I have two more questions for you. One question about the Singapore model. Obviously, mm. the criticism of the Singapore model is that it's a small, tiny city-state mm. or an island state, and it cannot, cannot, cannot be replicated on mm. any sort of scale whatsoever. Mm. So all's well and hunky-dory in Singapore, but it mm. cannot be done anywhere else. Mm. First question to you, can it be done anywhere else? Well, I, I'll tell you a famous story that Ratan Tata uh, said uh, when he I spoke with him at a forum in Singapore. He said for many years he used to go around India and saying, let's go and learn from Singapore. And he said the re automatic reaction would be, well, you know, India is so big, mm. Singapore is so small. The obvious. What can big India learn from little Singapore? And then he said, Deng Xiaoping came to Singapore. He saw what happened in Singapore. He replicated Singapore first three, four times, and then a hundred times, and then a thousand times, and China took off. So he says, maybe India can learn from China how to learn from Singapore. All right. My final question to you. Professor, we are on the verge of a big uh, epoch-defining election here in yeah. India in the next few months. Yeah. Uh, we have the BJP versus the Congress versus what's called the third trend versus the fourth yeah. entrant called the yeah. Ahmadmi Party. Yeah. What's going to happen to India's economic future? Give me a, prog a prognostication of what's going to likely to happen by 2018. Where will India be? Well, uh, politics is very important. And indeed, uh, to have good economics, you need good politics too. So if you have a divided, weak coalition government uh, after the next elections, then India will be in trouble. Do you think we'll have a divided, so weak coalition? I am the, uh, my friends tell me that the polls suggest that there could be a strong government uh, emerging. And if a strong government emerges and provides clear directions, uh, then I think the, uh, India's prospects are absolutely remarkable. Because one statistic which I give is that, you know, if, if the average Indian in India could achieve half the per capita income of the average Indian in America, same ethnic group, then India's GNP would not be 2 trillion, it would be 25 trillion, 10 times larger. So India is the one country which has the largest gap between its performance and its potential. So, but if India gets its politics right, then it can achieve this potential. In a democracy, that's not going to be easy. <laughs> not going to be easy, but it can be done. All right, Professor Mabubani, thank you for talking to us. My pleasure.